Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to church. What we've learned is we have to get the band started to play as fast as possible to get people in here. So if you would, please stand up, join me for prayer, and then we're going to have the band kick us off. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come down upon us. Bless this space. Bless the threshold of this sanctuary. When people pass through here, may they, be, may they enter into your peace, into wholeness. We pray also that you would bless uh, this time of worship, that we would actually uh, truly bring our heart to you, not worry about what other people are doing. Be willing to set aside the things in our lives that steal our peace and just focus this one hour on you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
just worship you, Father. I just pray that you would be with Paul in his message and that you would touch the hearts of everyone in this room. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Let's have all the children come down as you be seated. All the kiddos, come on. Let me see how many we have today. One, two, three, four. Any more want to come forward? Okay, good. Good deal. I've got something I want to talk to you about today. And I want to ask you a question. Who likes apples? You do? You like apples? Hey, Christopher, how, you, how are you doing today? You like apples, really? Would you like to have an apple today? Yeah, would you? Would you? Mm-hmm. Mmm, they're good. You really want an apple? Do you want this one? No. Why? It's because it's partially eaten. It's not a whole apple, so you don't want it. Suddenly it's gross. Well, it reminds me of a story. And when you go to lunch today, don't talk with your mouth full like I am, okay? It reminds me of a story in the Bible in, in the book of Matthew. It's a 22nd verse. And, and Jesus was asked a question about what is the greatest commandment. That's what he was asked. And you know what he said? He said, to love your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Now, notice, he didn't say to love your God, your God with part of your heart. What did he say? Whole heart, right? And it's kind of like apples. That's what reminded me of it. He didn't say... Uh, I want part of an apple, and you didn't say, I want part of an apple. You said, I want the whole apple, right? And so, just kind of think about that as we eat apples, because most of us eat an apple uh, every day or so. And, and let the apple remind you that Jesus wants your whole heart. And it's okay to have toys and dolls and friends and fun things. That's all great. But what we need to remember is that even though we have those things, it should never be more important than God, because God wants our whole heart okay so as we go off today and listen and play and do the things we do let's keep in mind that that god wants all of us our whole heart let's pray before we go back and sit down okay dear lord help us to always remember to give you our entire heart our whole heart and not just part of it in jesus name amen okay who really wants an apple now yeah that's what i thought here you go you can take that back to your seat. Let's give you one that doesn't have a bruise on it. Take that back to your seat. There you go. Here, do you want one too? I bet he does. He's just a little shy to come forward. And I said, where's Robin? Robin specifically asked for an apple. Here you go, Robin. <laughs> hey, you like them apples? How could you not say that? Set the whole joke up and didn't say it. Friends, this is the time in our service where I ask us to get to work, to pray together, to ask God to be at work. And there's something powerful when people gather under the name of Jesus and pray together. The scriptures call it being in agreement under Christ. And so uh, the word we use is amen. And my goal is to say prayers that the whole church can, can say amen to, because that means that's right, preacher. Um, and so in a moment, we're, we'll be praying together. And so whether you reflect the words that come out of this mouth or if you pray your own prayers on your heart, as we say amen after the Lord's Prayer at the end, I hope, hope that you can say it with your full heart. One thing we need to pray for today is this baptistry is full of warm water. And uh, we had a special service this morning. He, he was with us just a minute ago. He had to run and go get something. But Louis Turney, uh, who's a man who's been visiting our church for the past couple months, he came forward last week to place his care uh, and his profession of faith here at First Christian Church. And in our movement, if you haven't been baptized in the water and you do believe in Jesus Christ and you're able to stand for him, uh, then, then the next step, and here's Louis. Uh, we're going to have you come up here, Louis. Come on up. We're going to pray with you here in a minute. When you're able to do that, you come forward and receive holy baptism. And, and holy baptism, it's not hellfire insurance. You don't get baptized so that you can, you can, you know, reserve a place in heaven. Because the reserve a place in heaven occurs in your heart. Remember the guy that died on the cross next to Jesus? Was, did he, was he baptized? 
in the water? No, he wasn't. But he was baptized in his heart because he had the, what Paul calls the apostle the circumcision of the heart. And Louis had the circumcision of his heart. He knew the switch went. Where he said, oh, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And he came forward to profess that. The next baptism is baptism of the water. And that's where you come forward and you put a ring on it. You say, and now I'm married to you, Jesus. I know you're in my heart, but I want the whole world to know that I'm taken. I'm spoken for. And when you get married to somebody, what you're saying is that I'm united with you. That I'm united with you in your good and your bad, right? I'm loyal to you, and it also means that I, I will uh, turn away from evil. I will be faithful to one God, uh, and I'll walk in ways that glorify him. The third baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we'll get to that another time. But Louis came forward for his water baptism after the baptism of the heart. So part of our prayer is going to be to pray over Louis, and so that you all can share in that as well. You want to tell them what you told the other group? I love y'all. <laughs> I love y'all. <laughs> we are, we'll also be praying for uh, Mary Lou Lombrera. She passed away early this morning, 4.30 this morning up at Covenant. Uh, she, uh, she made a, a decision to, to go to palliative care and, and, uh, and trust her, her, uh, her soul with God as she passed. She knew that the end was near for her. So the family is, uh, needs to be comforted because they lost somebody, but this is what we would call a good death when you get to die with your family and you get to die at peace with good care. Are there any other uh, things that we can be praying for? College students? We'll pray, we'll pray for people in prison. We'll pray for college students. We'll pray for Louie, and we'll pray for Mary Lou's soul. And also, what we'll have is some time for silent for you to lift up your own prayers. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you through the power of your spirit and ask you to be with us and bless us during these prayers. We confess to you that our understanding of the mechanics of prayer is limited at best. But beyond our understanding, we know, we know it's effective to pray. We know that you can do things when your saints, when your church stands up before you and begs, asks, petitions you to be at work. And we know that when we do this, that you supply those who pray the peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace of your son that doesn't make sense. And so it's through the spirit that we offer these prayers to you. We pray first and foremost, Lord, for you to be with Mary Lou, with her reception into your kingdom, that you would open up and show her things that she is now prepared to receive, things that those of us left on this side of the grave can only try to imagine. We pray that you bless Mary Jane, her daughter, Chavo, her husband, and the rest of this family, that you wrap them in your care, that before loneliness or uh, sadness or grief weave their shadows around them, Father, that you wrap them in your spirit so that this can be healthy and helpful for the upbuilding of their faith as a family. In the name of Jesus, we pray for Louis, who has submitted to water baptism, just like your son was immersed in death and resurrected into new life. We pray that Louis, like the rest of the baptized, would have the life of Christ where we get to experience life beyond death, where we can submit ourselves and live a new life for you on this earth so that the kingdom of God isn't something that we just wait for, but something we live in today. We pray that you bless him with the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well, that he'd be empowered to walk faithfully with you, that he could look back on this day of baptism for him that he shared with his brothers and sisters here and use that as a powerful a source of your spirit, a sacrament of your church to guide him and lead him. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ for our college students, for the testing that they'll have. We pray that they learn to worship you, the almighty God, not the almighty grade. We pray in Jesus' name that their, their, um, their worth, their identity wouldn't be wrapped up with a uh, performance on a scantron. But Father, but that they would already be sealed and held dear in your arms, knowing fully that they are your loved, beloved uh, child or daughter, our son. In the name of Jesus, we pray also for those who have uh, 
been making mistakes and are now serving their time in prison, we pray that you would go locate them and wrap them in your care as Louis asked, that you would bless them and keep them, that you would make your face shine on them as well, and that you would give them the peace that surpasses understanding. We pray most importantly, Lord, as we end this prayer, that your church here at First Christian would be faithful to you, that we would jump when you say jump, that we would pause and listen when you ask us to, and that in all things we would learn the voice of our shepherd, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray the prayer that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. We're turning to the scriptures today in Matthew's Gospel, 13th chapter. It's a short reading. It's verses 14 through 15. Jesus is quoting the prophet Isaiah when he's talking about the people that he's trying to pastor to while Jesus was alive. And these words, if, it's, if G- Isaiah said it and Jesus quotes them, you know it's pretty important. And so it has something to say to us today. And may God's blessing fall upon the reading and the hearing and the understanding of these words. Jesus said, With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah which says, You shall indeed hear, but never understand. You shall indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's hearts has grown dull. And their ears are heavy of hearing, and their eyes have closed. Lest they should perceive with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn to me to heal them. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we know that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that you feed us. And so we pray this day that you would feed us by pouring into me the gift of preaching and pouring into your congregation a hunger and a thirst to be fed by you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Friends, this is the first of a three-week sermon series, brand new sermon series that we're starting this Sunday. Last week was, I call it a one-hit wonder, one sermon on All Saints, All Saints Sunday. And last, uh, the week before that, we ended a sermon series based on stewardship. Do you remember that? I'm a, I'm a sermon series guy. I think you're getting used to that. And that gives us the opportunity to focus on, on, a, on a, really a long sermon over several weeks. Well, I have this assumption about God's Word. And, it's, and it's, it, I hope it's a good assumption because it's how I live. But I assume, and I think some of you do too, that God's not trying to trick us. That like he actually, when he speaks a word, he wants you to understand. There's a famous line in Deuteronomy chapter 30 where Moses is telling, it's his last speech before he dies. He tells the people before entering the promised land, he said, now don't any of you say that the word of God is like on the other side of the sea and cry that nobody will go and swim and get it for you. And don't you say that the word of God is up in heaven and beg, who can go up to heaven and achieve and reach it for us? Moses said, no, the word of God is before you. It's right in front of you, easy to perceive, able to, you're able to grasp it. I call that keeping your cookies on the bottom shelf. Easy to get. And believing that, each of the sermon series we've had have really been simplifying. Have you noticed that? Remember worship, the basic move of worship? I asked you to not be the audience, but to be the worshipers. And if you're going to be a worshiper, the main resource you need to bring with you, your piece of equipment is what? Your heart. And the goal of worship, according to the scriptures, is taking your heart and bringing it near God. Draw near to me with your heart. In fact, he he judges people that don't do that. He says, you come to me with your lips and with your tongues and with your singing, while your hearts are far from me. And so the goal of worship, just to simplify, is to take your heart and to shrink the distance that has been building up between you and God. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
So everything we do in worship is about to achieve that goal. Well, stewardship's the same way. I tried to dumb down stewardship and say, this is what the Bible teaches before we get all fancy with it. What are we supposed to be doing? What's the relationship? And when we started off, when I was first able to come and be your preacher, we started with a Y series, where I tried to take our church and ask the basic questions of faith. And we're going to have this series every single year. It's going to be answered in unique ways. But do you remember the three questions we asked? Why does the world, why does the world need Jesus? I know a lot of churches that work really hard have fancy ministries, but don't have an answer to that question. Why does the world need Jesus Christ? The second question is, why does the world need the church? And then the third question is, why does the world need First Christian Church? If we were to fold, what would the world be missing? Those are pretty hard questions. It's like they hit the heart of the matter. Well, this week we're starting a new sermon series based on one major question, and it's the question of what pleases God. What makes God happy? You're in a relationship with somebody. We're all in a relationship with God, but pretend you're in a relationship with, with your spouse or with a brother or sister or friend. And if you're going to be a good partner in that relationship, it's a good act and practice to know what pleases the other person, right? Do they like thank you notes? Is it important that I remember their birthday? What pleases them? Uh, is it important that I pick my dirty t-shirts off the floor so Valerie's not mad? Yes. <laughs> what pleases the people I'm in a relationship with? And so if you're in a relationship with God, which I pray and beg you to be in through Christ, then that's a, that's a worthy question to say. If I'm in a relationship, how do I please God? What makes God uh, happy? What does he desire? Well, Jesus went about preaching the gospel, and the thing that he preached connected to the gospel was this phrase, the gospel of the kingdom of God. That was all, if you read in the scriptures, beginning in Mark chapter 2, the first thing Jesus preached, the core message, was he preached the good news of the kingdom of God. He didn't preach the good news that, 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 everybody, that God loves everybody, which he does. He didn't preach the good news of go to church. You know, I got good news for you. You need to go to church. That's not good news. That's just news. Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom of God. And it's important to understand if his message, you have to connect it to that basic gist of what is the kingdom of God. And if you're dealing with a kingdom being established on earth, like Jesus talked, particularly God's kingdom, a kingdom is established and a kingdom is set when the king gets what the king wants, right? That's how reign works, to reign over something, to rule over something, to really simplify it, when the king, the emperor, the dictator, whoever, gets what they want. And so the best definition I've ever heard of the kingdom of God is that the kingdom of God is when God gets what God wants. That makes sense? Whenever, however, wh whatever, God wants, when God gets it, that's the kingdom of God. And there's going to be the day when the, the consummation comes and everybody gets to witness the kingdom of God because God comes back in the name of Jesus and claims what's rightfully his. All of this. And at that point, the only thing that will exist is what God wants. Right? Because his reign will be, the scriptures teach, and every knee will bend and every tongue will confess. At some point, the kingdom of God will be fully established. And what that means is at some point, God's going to get what he wants, 100%. In the meantime, Christians are called to give God his kingdom now. Give God what God wants now. So I went through the scriptures quickly, and, and I mean, I'm a Bible guy, like, like several of y'all, and I know that and if I ask the question, what does God want, you could rattle off some scriptures to me or some ideas. Some of the, some of the stuff's not even in the Bible, but it's a pretty good idea. You could quote Matthew or, or Micah 6, 8. That's what I hear a lot. What does the Lord require of you? I could, I mean, tons of, uh, per brain and per heart in this room, there's probably five things you could tell me what God wants. And if you were to take all the things that came in, I, I really do believe we could categorize them in three clean placements. The first thing God wants, and we're going to spend a week on each one, the first thing God wants is he wants you. He want, and, and scripturally, that means he wants access to your heart. That's number one. Second thing God wants, obedience. 
I'm meddling, aren't I? God wants you to be obedient. The third thing that God wants is for us to get along. I know that sounds pretty obvious, doesn't it? God wants your heart, God wants you to obey, and God wants you to quit fighting. So imagine for a minute that you're actually a father, like our Heavenly Father. What would you want for your family? What would make you happy in your family? More money? I'll tell you what would make me happy. If my son and my daughter would come and sit on the edge of my bed and share their heart with me. Wouldn't that make you happy? If your kids would open up to you. And it would sure make me happy if my kids obeyed me. <laughs> Especially in public, right? <laughs> and on top of all that, when we're driving somewhere, it'd be nice if they quit fighting in the back seat. Heart, obedience, get along. That's where we're going to go with this sermon series. And I didn't make this stuff up. It's, I mean, this is scriptural teachings. And so we'll pull out a different scripture for each one. So today specifically, we're talking about it pleases God when God has access to your heart. God gets his kingdom. God gets what God wants when he gets your heart. That's what he's after. You've heard that from me, haven't you? The goal of worship is to offer your heart to God. The goal of tithing is... Yeah, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. God, trust me, God doesn't need your cash at all. You're not, you're, you're not loaning God a dollar, okay? God doesn't need your money. God wants what's attached to it. He calls us to tithe so that he can have access to your heart. That's why you do it. God wants you to pray because when you pray to God for real, and at times praying to God when you really need to is almost like curling up in the fetal position and crying. Sometimes it's jumping up and down and doing a happy dance. When you pray legitimately to God, you're giving God what's on your heart. You're giving God full access to your heart. When you come to the table, when you submit for baptism, when you sing to God, you're giving God, hopefully, at that point, your heart. And right now, just being here and choosing to pay attention instead of making a grocery list I picked up bulletins, not here, but I picked up bulletins at a church before and found grocery lists on them. Just a quick note, on the, la the next week we actually had in the back of the thing printed grocery list. <laughs> but if you're here right now truly expecting God to speak a word to you, you're giving God access to your heart. You see that? You're giving God what he wants. You're giving him a chance. Well, Matthew 13, Jesus teaches, he's quoting Isaiah. Now, here, if... if if Jesus Christ quotes you, that means you said something right. So Isaiah said something right on this one. And Jesus quotes Isaiah by saying that people who have been working a religious system, people who've been trying, they're not bad, they've developed the ability to do things religiously. They've maintained the ability of being, um, of being able to talk and to pray and to say all the right words. They know the culture. But their hearts are calloused, is what the scriptures I study say. This, this reading said dull. Pharaoh's heart was frozen. And because their hearts are callous, says Jesus through, through Isaiah, nothing else makes sense. Though they see, they can't understand. Though they hear, they can't perceive. Because their hearts are dull. So they have the ability, but they can't quite make sense of the world. This isn't just a churchy thing. If you're going through an incredibly stressful situation where the peace of Jesus is under attack in your heart, it's pretty hard to pay attention, amen? Have you ever tried to register for insurance online while holding two crying babies? I mean, like, life's hard if the heart's not in a good spot. Have you ever tried to, to take a test while you're stressed? It's no good. Same with religious work. Same with being the church, doing ministry. You can have the physical, the mental, the resource abilities to do all these things for God, but if your heart is callous, then your life just doesn't work. Nothing grasps. I, I call it that you're clutching and grabbing. You're not going anywhere. The same is true with the church. 
we could have the church established perfectly. Streamlined committees are running. You got your preacher in place. The baptistry's full. The candles are lit. The deacons have the table set. Everything looks great. But if God can't locate a couple of thawed hearts in the congregation, there is no fruit. There is no word received. There is no good happening. There is no effectiveness. And there is no kingdom. Because God didn't get what he wanted. Does that make sense? It's kind of a mind blower. So it's important to grasp that for your life to please God, it's necessary for you to choose to go to God and say, I desire to give you what you want. You know, I hope, I hope you get this, that just wanting to please God pleases God. You get that, right? Just, ple- just desiring to, to say that God has a right to be pleased with me. That's a big step. And once you grasp that, you start going to God saying, I want to be pleasing unto you. I want to be one of the few on this planet that is easy to work with, God. That moves mountains. Now, why does God want access to your heart? I don't know. It doesn't really say. Why does Valerie want me to pick up the shirts? I don't know. Does. Why does God want access to my heart? There, there's times I don't want access to my heart. There are times I don't want to know what's going on in my heart because it's so stressful, or because there's so much shame, or because I've been hurt. I just don't want to open those doors. Have you ever been there? Why in the world would God want access to me? There are parts of my heart that I don't want to share with anybody, even the people I'm closest with. And it's a big deal for me to open up to the most pure being on the planet, God Almighty, Yahweh, and to give him access to walk in the deep, dark recesses of my heart. I don't know why God wants access to your heart. All I know is that he does. I just know he does. And God knows. God knows when he's dealing with a thawed heart, with a pliable heart. Because he knows that if he were to walk into your bedroom tonight and put a truth in you, into your heart, put a revelation in your heart, something that you don't believe, if he were to put something in your heart that you don't already know, or something that makes you uncomfortable, God knows the hearts that would receive that. He does. And God also knows. He knows the hearts that are willing to go down that deep hallway to that door in the back of your heart that you've had locked shut forever. He knows which ones will walk that hallway with him. Behind that door is addiction, shame, the biggest wounds you've ever had. You know why that door's there? It's because you've learned to cope and you said, I've been through these things, I know these things, and God, I have put them away so that I could be functioning If it's good enough for me, why can't it be good enough for you, God? It's my life. God knows the people who will give him access to that door. One of my favorite pictures, Christian pictures, paintings, is based on Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says, I I, hear, I stand at your door and I knock. And if you'll open the door, then I'm going to come in, and I'm going to feast with you and you with me, and we will be together. And on that painting, most of you have seen that painting. He's usually holding a lantern. It's a rounded out door. If you look carefully, on Jesus' side of the door, there's no door handle. He can't open it. He's just knocking. To open the door of your heart. And you may have given God two inches into your heart. I mean the deep recesses. To open the door of your heart before God. You're opening yourself up to miracles. You're opening yourself up to healing. You're opening yourself up to God. You're opening yourself up to the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you and we beg you to show us 
how important it is to want to be pleasing in your sight. We pray that you would be at work in our hearts, that you would indeed find in us people who are wanting to learn how to let you in. Many of us in this room have learned to cope. We've learned to do the things that make us look right. We've learned to manufacture peace as opposed to receive the peace of your son, Jesus. Instead of healing, we believe in band-aids. Instead of uh, being cured of addiction, we believe in running, Lord. But we pray in Jesus' name that you go and locate us and you put your finger right on the spots of our lives that need to be touched and healed. And we pray that when you do these things, we would burst with joy and give you the credit and the glory. We pray that your kingdom would be worked out in us. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would have full access to what you rightfully deserve. The hearts that you've made. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
be seated. On the night when Jesus was about to face some really troubling things, including being deserted by all of his followers and being betrayed by one of them, uh, having to die in a place that was so public, uh, and him so exposed, and yet not to have anybody from his church there, it was unbelievably painful. For him to know that he would have to pray a word that included, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? This was all to occur within the next 48 hours. Knowing all of that, he sat down for a meal with his disciples and he decided to look around that table and still love them. During this meal, knowing all of these things, he took a loaf of bread. He thanked God the Father for it. He blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat of it, all of you. And every time that you gather and you eat from this bread, remember, remember me. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. Your love that's all around us in this beautiful fall day. Your love that you died on the cross for, for us. Lord, we thank you for your ultimate sacrifice and everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the same way, after the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine. He poured it out. He thanks God for this cup, and then he said, this, this is the new covenant, the new relationship that we have with God, and it is poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for many people. Drink of it, all of you, and every time that you gather and you drink from this cup, remember, remember me, for as often as we eat of the bread, and we drink of the cup. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Creator God, we, um, as we walk to your table, we, we come, we approach your table with humbleness. Lord, we pray that as we come to this table that um, we bring our heart with us. We open our heart to you. And just as... Jesus shed his blood on the cross for us, which represented by this cup. We pray, Lord, that we would open our hearts and we would share in that sacrifice, that we would leave here at this table at the foot of the cross our sins. And, Lord, we just walk away from this table realizing that Christ has taken upon himself our sins and that we're cleansed and we're washed from those sins and that we're made acceptable in your sight and we walk away from this table being accepted and loved by you and Lord we just pray that we can um, share that love with those around us and it's in Christ's name we pray Amen Friends you're invited to come forward take a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup we also have baskets for those who'd like to give a tithe or offering <laughs>
Friends, in a moment, we're going to stand and sing our closing song. And this is a chance for you to sing to the one true God. Remember, you aren't singing to impress me or your neighbor, but an audience of one. This is also an opportunity to come forward. And, and if, you, if you're called to do this, to come forward and publicly claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And also, you're, avail- you're uh, invited to come forward to receive the right hand of fellowship. If you know that First Christian is to be your worship community, if you want to place your membership and your commitment here at the church. Please stand as we sing. the entire written Word of God in one evening. We call this prayer event the Word Marathon, and we need your help on Tuesday, November 11th at 6 p.m. in our own sanctuary. Each person will receive a scripture assignment of 13 chapters to be prayed out loud. Your reading is unique to you. Together, we will bless our sanctuary by simply praying God's Word together. Child care will be provided. Bingo, pizza, popcorn. The membership committee invites you to join us in Kirkendall Hall for a family fun night on November the 16th from 6 to 8 p.m. The cost of admission is one can of food per bingo card, which will be donated to the You Can Share food drive. So the more cans you bring, the more chances you have to win. Children are welcome and encouraged to participate. We hope you'll come join us. Hello friends. On Sunday before Thanksgiving is the CWF annual bake sale. This is the only fundraiser of the year, so we ask that everyone bring baked goods or casseroles and also come prepared to buy something very tasty. Before our benediction, please know our word marathon is this Tuesday night here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. This is the entire Bible 
and 98 scripture readings. Each of these scripture readings takes 45 minutes to an hour. You'll be handed one at random. Hopefully you don't get one full of genealogies. <laughs> You'll be praying the word of God next to somebody who's praying something completely a, a different part. Uh, I'm going to have two batches, hoping we have even more than 98 people. We'll have water in the back for your, for your help while, while you're praying. And it's just an opportunity to pray, not to study, just to pray the word of God out loud. We need your voice. Join me now for our benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and shine upon you and give you his peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.